Uh, we have Alina Hippinen here who did this work. But this is a study that she did of um, some 7,000 people. Because it was done of people who were age 45, and what this shows is that in the winter, now this, this, is, this is the average population in the UK. In the winter, it's about 35 nanomoles. At the end of the summer, it's 75 nanomoles. Very rough guide. If we take the experts call to action to get the level above 100 nanomoles, that says everybody in this country is deficient all year round. To get from here to 100 nanomoles, sorry, from here to 100 nanomoles, very roughly would take 2,000 units of vitamin D a day. To get from here, 4,000 units. That's what I have read. That's my understanding of it. Um, in, in Germany, there's a product, 20,000 units. People take that once a week. That gives them, on average, 3,000 units a day. And, and that's generally available on prescription. Unfortunately, here in this country, it's a special, and the doctors and the pharmacists have problems either prescribing it or supplying it. Um, but we will discuss this with the Department of Health and with NICE. It's even worse in Scotland. This is, I don't know the size of this sample, um, but look, look how low this is. If, if this lack of vitamin D is the cause of a number of health issues, then it's not fried Mars bars in Scotland that's causing the health problems. It's this. Um, I spoke to a number of hospitals, Ealing Hospital. These are people who were tested in Ealing Hospital, so their doctor thought there might have been a problem. So this is not average patient samples. 5,000 people tested in nanomoles. The government advice at the moment is it should be above 50. That says that 70% of that population was deficient. And, and you who see these people in, in clinics and uh, 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 see, this, see this problem many times. And Dr. Colin Mickey, consultant paediatrician in any hospital, over a three-year period, 17 infants admitted with seizures, secondary to vitamin D deficiency, raised alkaline phosphatase levels, parathyroid hormone levels, delays in achieving gross motor milestones. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. These people presented in emergency room. There are Somali girls who've arrived in this country, got married, had babies. Baby's got a problem, so they turn up in hospital. It is the first time, there are one or two examples where it's the first time they've ever seen a British doctor. So this is the, the, scale, the scale of the problem in, um, in, in part of the hospitals. Um, Paddington, this set me off on a course of, um, of interaction with the hospital, and the hospital is trying very hard to resolve this problem. Um, and uh, what we would like after the meeting yesterday is the, the doctors in the hospital develop some new guidelines which are taken up to um, the um, public health specialists who then issue them to the local doctors, either thou shalt or would you please uh, test pregnant women. Um, are there any points that people would like to bring up and discuss? Are there any things that we think we should take away from this and, uh, and deal with any major actions? We've got a, 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 a broad spread of people here. We've got health visitors, we've got public health people. Yesterday I had a letter home from my son's school saying, now the hot weather is here, please ensure that you send your child to school covered up. And um, when you send the sun cream in, can you, we'll put it in the first aid room and we'll put it on at lunchtime. And 
which, and I get that from me, oh, they go to three different schools and so they're three different age groups. And on a very individual level, we've obviously got the big strategic level, because I also work for public health, so you've got that battle with the funding. But on a very individual level as a parent and little things, tiny steps you can do at a very local level, how, how do I then go into the school and say, he's not going to get skin cancer, <laughs> please let him run around with... We've had 30 years of brainwashing, I think, to suggest that we ought to cover up the body, and I think it's going to take a few years yet for that message to pass on. Oh, hi. Yeah, you talked a lot about um, the vitamin D supplementation and uh, sun exposure. Um, I just wondered, so obviously you're recommending taking uh, supplements, but after a sunny holiday, um, sunbathing, then how long will that keep you going for until you have to start taking the supplements again? I think we heard from Reinhold Wieth that the half-life is one to two months. So it depends how much sun input you've got. Right. Going back to the question about schools and sunscreen, I do think it's slightly different when you've got a low adult to child ratio because we are told that you shouldn't burn. And I think it's up to parents to know their children's own skin. And I would think it was safer probably to go along with the school during school time, but when you're supervising your children, you can make sure they get sun exposure without burning. I think that's the difficulty you're up against, and particularly with nursery age children as well. So I think, I mean, I know, I can see your point that you're trying to educate, and I think what we need to do is look in our own areas of the priority that's given to the sun save message, and whether it's appropriate for the local population. The area I was talking about, 75% at least are non-white. We shouldn't have loops in GP surgeries with the sun safe message. We don't. Um, well, remember, remember that the half-life is one to two months. If you top it up once in a month by going, to the, the, by going without sunscreen and, and sunbathing, it, that, that's, that's a major factor. Um, I checked on Amazon uh, a couple of days ago and there were at least 14 different products available freely on Amazon in Britain um, with 5,000 units oh, yes. um, and there were two which were 50,000 units that you could just order um, and of course a lot of others but they're all different preparations in different types of oils, different types of dried capsules and I'm wondering is any research done on their potency as to whether they are actually what they say they are? Um, in America, there's an organization like which called Consumer Lab, and they do a comparison of the, um, the efficacy or the strength according. Uh, so, uh, but that's a subscription service like which, but they, they do do that. Um, it, it all sounds so exciting if there is potential to reduce uh, cesarean rates, preeclampsia, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, etc., etc. But I think that the arguments would have more credibility, both with policymakers and with the public, if there was some discussion of the potential for overdose. Because I know that's what doctors are still worried about, and I know uh, Eleanor uh, referred to uh, potential risks of increasing allergic diseases, and I, th I think if there was some credible data there, that would help the whole argument. Well, um, Reinhold Wieth's certainly been doing this for 20 or 30 years, and he, um, he pointed to some of that work. And then Bruce mentioned that he was building upon that, and part of his first major trial, of course, was to, to prove that it, that, that it was safe to give pregnant women 4,000 units. Um, there are... I was talking to a paediatrician in one of the breaks, and he said there are more studies that have been done in Britain about some of these, this work. So let's see if we can pull this together, and we'll put it up on our website and, and keep you informed. Thank you. I'm Trixie Mackery, consultant midwife at Northwick Park Hospital. Um, what occurs to me as we've been discussing all these things, it'd be very helpful if we had if we pooled our resources together, there's all different people doing different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And I'm not sure, Rufus, if that's your role, either today or it will be now after this. But it seems we could, you know, to do a really good study, it needs resources, it needs, you know, research assistance, it needs, we're all using the same kind of um, vitamin D supplementation tablets, so you would have no holes in your study. 
and we could do it all over the UK, for example, but we'd need someone to coordinate it and looking for the funding. And if we all came together and did something, wouldn't we be effective? We could go from preconception and then do a longitudinal study that finishes at 10 years or 20 years or whatever. Um, I'd be interested in coming on a committee for that. I think <laughs> you should lead it. Good, good, thank you, and, and I will. Um, I've been studying this privately as a non-medical person for 18 months, and I started out by talking to Elena and uh, Oliver, and they said, have a look at SACAN, the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, and have a look at NICE. Well, I've, I'm, Mike Fisher here and I are probably the only people who, between us, have been to every meeting of SACAN <coughs> for the last 18 months. And you'll see in the minutes of last February, Mr. Greenbaum's correspondence was discussed. He was informed that what he's asking for is risk management. And this committee only does risk assessment. In other words, Sacken writes reports and tosses them over the fence to uh, the, the Department of Health and say, you, you deal with it. Um, and, but that's throwing a little bit of a negative point on it. To their credit, Sacken has a new chair, um, Dr. Anne Prentice, uh, and she has raised this subject to the top of the agenda of Sacken, and they, in February they started a new study. But that will take three years, and if, if you talk to any government minister, they will wait for Sacken. So that's going to take nearly three years. On the other hand, there's NICE. And uh, and Thursday, NICE has, has called for the first meeting, a pre-meeting almost, to ask for inputs as to what would people like Sacken to look at and what they will do. And I think that probably that is going to be the quickest route. On an ad hoc basis, um, I will be very happy to act as a focus and a, and a coordinator and a communicator We'll put it on the Vitamin D Association web website, so the information is there. Um, I'm waiting till these two days of conferences are over to modify the website and put up a few hundred scientific papers that are open public information. Part of these meetings has been to summarize an enormous amount of data and try and bring people who are knowledgeable and expert. And I'm very pleased with today. I think we've seen an enormous amount of information um, from the experts who've shown us uh, what, what they're doing and, and so on. So I think, that's, I think we're making progress, and I'll be happy to, to work with you and others to take it further.